point. Hello, hello, hello everyone. Sergio, hello. Okay, great. See. Uh, Okay, today we will be talking about art of blending. Let me find Frank. Hello, Ahmed. I'm here. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Irem, Hello. what happened? Is it winter in Barcelona or what? It is. It's winter I'm in, in Barcelona. You're in a thick woolen sweater. What's going wrong? Yes, actually, it's winter in Barcelona almost. No. <laughs> it has been raining since uh, Saturday night, nonstop, and today it stopped a little bit. Yeah. And some sun we saw today, like I think for half an hour, mm -hmm. and then the rest was cloudy. And no. the other problem is in Barcelona, in many houses, there is no heating system. Like, there is no. no heating, fixed heating system. We have this uh, air system, which I don't like because it makes the air super dry. And yeah. I have a sore throat, so I try to not to turn it on. So mm -hmm. instead, I'm putting my <laughs> wool sweater. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It looks funny. Um, here, actually, the weather was great. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, where I live, uh, went up to 23 degrees, which is uh, really very nice for April, actually, for us. So, um, and, it's, and it's very dry. Uh, not far from here, there's a huge uh, uh, fire in, uh, mm -hmm. in a natural park. And I uh, mm -hmm. haven't been wow. able to stop it because there's a lot of wind. Wow. So, um, it's, it's going on already for the third day now. Yeah. Wow, I, I hope they can stop it soon. Yeah, we don't yeah, want well, any other fire disaster. No, it's 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 not. Of course, not as bad as as, as it can happen as it can be in Spain sometimes. But it's it's quite yeah. bad, and they had to move quite a few people um, to be sure. Yeah, to be, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Yes. Um, uh, today we are going to talk about who? Yeah. Uh, Martins. I don't know yeah, who Martins. 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 Hi. <laughs> Today we will be talking about art of blending. Yes. Um, I was thinking, we said art of blending, but then I was thinking maybe we could make the topic more controversial. Say, blending is an art or a science. <laughs> mm -hmm. So why would it be a science? I think it is, it is I mean, much of it is science, eh? I think. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, yes, the blend, I, I think to me, Art of blending, we say art of blending, but it's not only art. Uh, science, knowledge, experience, art, and also vision. No, that, that's absolutely true. You're right there. You're right. Maybe, maybe science is not the right word, but, but you need a vision. That's absolutely mm -hmm. true. And from what I understand, the best blenders are the people who have a vision on what they want to achieve. They, mm -hmm. I, I've heard on numerous occasions that uh, Michel Roland should be one of the best blenders you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And that his uh, sort of strength is that uh, when he works for a winery, he has a vision on, how, on what he wants to achieve as, an, as a sort of uh, end result. And he's working mm -hmm. towards that in his blending. And that is... Uh, and, and apparently he's, he's extremely good in that. I've, I've heard many people say that's actually, that is his most important skill, his blending, yeah. uh, his blending qualities. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm, at April, uh, a good friend of mine, she, I think she's, are you based now? Where are you, April? The United States or Malaga? She's also producing wine, uh, Navarra from Navarra. And she says uh, balance for blending. Yeah, exactly. With with with, uh, with blending, it's 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 actually much easier to reach perfect balance with with blending. But mm -hmm. what I what I always notice is that um, most winemakers do not care to talk about it a lot. I'm I'm not sure why actually, but but there is one one general feeling I've got, and that is that um, in in today's market. Um, uh, blending, talking out blending is maybe not so fashionable because I think one of one of the really 
maybe even the most important, um, how should I say, most important element, the most important word, the most important motivation for mm -hmm. for wine lovers when it comes to to high end wines is authenticity, and mm -hmm. and, and I find it an obsession actually that. It's, it's actually a general cultural thing. It's uh, our society is obsessed with authenticity, whatever that means, because it's open to whatever kind of interpretation, also in wine. But mm -hmm. um, if um, if you want to sell, if you want to sell wine, especially more expensive wine, then you need to claim authenticity. And, mm -hmm. and in a way, I have a feeling that for many people, not for me, but for many people, blending is a bit opposite the opposite of authenticity and if you mm -hmm. think about it that then, then the trend nowadays is single vineyard wines blah 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 uh, look at look in spain you know rioja cover um, parache mm -hmm. um priorat uh, with its classification single vineyard single vineyard single vineyard um which which comes down to authenticity but it's also a little bit opposed to to the idea of blending Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and, and my view is that, you know, if if what for me is in a good vintage, usually Spain's very best red wine is Vega Sicilia Unico. And mm -hmm. Vega Sicilia Unico is for me the example of the perfect blend. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually proves my point that um, mm -hmm. that blending is, uh, is, is, is maybe one of the most, maybe even the most important element of, of winemaking. Um, so going back to authenticity, yes, authenticity is kind of the hip at the moment and everyone is looking for something authentic, not in the wine world only, like if they want to purchase no. something, they want, they want something authentic, even like the person, like they want to yeah. look for an authentic person. But I think blending, yes, uh, when you said the single, one, uh, single grape, single uh, vineyard uh, expressions, maybe it can be opposite of authenticity but you can also re achieve authenticity with blending you can of produce course, course. amazing authentic wines by blending of course of course of course but you know um but but, but i think i think probably uh winemakers are quite often blending more than we know and maybe want to know let's not forget for example that it is perfectly legal in europe to to add up to what is it 15 percent of another vintage mm -hmm. that it is perfectly legal to add a certain percentage of another grape variety and i bet i bet that when many winemakers are doing that but they won't tell you because they don't want to spoil the idea of authenticity mm -hmm. and um, um and and um, it's a and it's a bit ridiculous in a way. But for mm -hmm. example, if you think of uh, somebody who is uh, considered very authentic and a wine which is considered very authentic is Vigna Tondonia, mm -hmm. Reserva or Grand Reserva, and actually the owners, the Lopez de Heredia family, they are proud actually to, to, to tell you that, they're, that they are always blending in blending. Other, vin other vintages. They mm -hmm. always do that. And actually, to be honest, uh, Everybody in Spain who is producing Reserva and Gran Reserva is uh, doing a so-called freshening up before bottling, refrescar, and for that they use a, a, a more recent vintage. It's perfectly mm -hmm. legal, but they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, just April just said the same thing, uh, refreshing the vintage with the previous vintage. Um, no. So uh, many people, when they hear blending, I think first of all they think of blending grape varieties, but. On the other yeah. hand, they don't know they don't know that many wines that they're drinking it's a blend. It's not only blending the grape varieties. You blend sure. different batches, different oak barrels, different uh, vineyards, and blending uh, press wine and exactly uh, free run wine. No, no, blending mm -hmm. is, is a very very broad subject actually. Mm -hmm. but, yes. but if um, um, you you know that I'm also involved in this uh, small project in Navarra. Mm -hmm. And um, it uh, took us a bit of um, conviction skills um, um, to persuade the wine, the winemaker of the of the winery, to vinify the different plots, the small plots separately, and keep the press wines separate as well. 
he was like, mm -hmm. you know, wh why would we do that? It's just extra work. We might as well use one big tank. So, no, because I want to keep my hands free for blending. I want more blending options. So mm -hmm. now I've got six blending options instead of two, you mm -hmm. know. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not always in the thinking of winemakers, but mm -hmm. for me, it's the way to get to the best possible result. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, on the other hand, uh, blending is also something that which has been uh, practicing for like centuries. And yeah. uh, I mean, yes, many blends that maybe we can talk about the specific blends in the classic wine regions. But the first thing that I remember is field blend also. Like, for example, in Alsace, when we went to Alsace together, uh, Marcel Deis, he's yeah. doing the field blend, which was traditionally done in Alsace. Yeah. Instead yeah. of doing single varieties, he's yeah. doing feed blend. Yeah, that's and true. I, and yeah. his wines are super authentic to me. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. But field blend is, of course, a bit different in a way that um, when, when the, the blending that we talked about is something where the winemaker is, um, is offered possibilities to create what he wants to create. With a field blend, you, you don't have that control because you harvest all the grapes, the different varieties in one go, and you ferment mm -hmm. them together. But, but it adds to more complexity, for sure, eh? and to very interesting, very, uh, very uh, authentic interpretations of the vineyard. So why not? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm, I, have you ever had a blending experience? Did you do a blending? Yeah, Were yeah, you yeah, involved? Many yeah. Many times, yeah. yeah. In Spain, Still wines. In Champagne, yeah. And Champagne as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, let's, yeah, let's sure. talk about blending in Champagne. We restarted this topic on Monday with Champagne. We said we will dedicate uh, yeah. the most of the week to, to the bubbles. Uh, yeah. Blending in sh Champagne. I mean, houses versus growers, like Monday's topic. But also blending in champagne, it's not also uh, something that the houses do because also blending, uh, growers, they do a blending too. Exactly. I always say in my lectures that 99.8% uh, of champagne is actually blended because mm -hmm. you're, you're not just blending different varieties. Um, you're also usually blending different plots, different vintages, um, Maybe for, for the, the not so good wines, uh, you're blending cuvée and taille. But, mm -hmm. but let's, let's reverse that. Eh? What is an unblended champagne? An unblended champagne would mean that it's a wine from one vineyard, one variety, one vintage, mm -hmm. just cuvée. Mm -hmm. That does exist. We're talking about Claude de Menil, Claude de Monet, a handful of other small plots, uh, Claude saint Hilaire, whatever. That mm -hmm. represents nothing. I mean, they're famous wines, but on the total volume of Champagne, they mean nothing. So basically, mm -hmm. Champagne is almost always a blend, no matter how you look mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and I there, Champagne, then that's, I think to me, it's like a, one of the real arts. Because like if you think yeah. about one of the very famous Champagnes, Veuve Clicquot, like the, the yellow label uh, from Veuve Clicquot, it is a blend of like 400, almost 400 different wines. Yeah, and yeah. and the consistency every year that they achieve it's not only uh, well, it's Bollinger, Krug. Uh, so I think that's that's a very incredible skill. It is, it is, and and actually, um, um, it looks easier than it is because you could say, well, you know, guys, come on, if you've got the same four hundred plots every year, then you're just blending what you've got. But that's not true, because you have to. Um, the winemaker, the chef de cave, who was responsible for all that, and actually, I think uh, um, uh, making base wine in Champagne is relatively easy. It's the blending that is the real skill. But mm -hmm. um, the, the the person who's making the blends, he has to think of what he's got. The, the, the let's say in this case, 400 different plots. He has to think of the reserve wines that he has in stock, but he also mm -hmm. has to think of future reserves. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of a story that Eric Lebel, the, the former chef de cave of Krug, told me one day. Uh, it was about one of the famous Champagne vintages. I, I, I believe it was 1996, which Krug did not release. And he mm -hmm. explained the reason why. Um, he was a, a bit short on top quality reserve wines. So instead of making, a, of bottling a, a Krug 96, he needed, um, the, the, he needed 96 to serve, to, to improve the average level of his reserve wines in the cellar. 
And that was mm -hmm. the reason. So actually, in that case, um, in the, it's also a little bit about, the, about mathematics, actually, about uh, making calculations, risk management yeah. for the future, etc., which is a, yeah. Yeah, maybe more science than you would believe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's where the science comes in. Um, yeah. I had I had two uh, blending experiences so far, like really sh obviously short. Uh, both in Toreo, in in I was gonna say Cava producer, but it Probably is Corpinat producer now yeah. in San Sadurni. I did two vintages there, sixteen, two thousand sixteen, and two thousand seventeen. Uh, one of the vintages that I was doing, I think seventeen. I'm not really sure which one it is. I was involved in the. Um, in the red wine blending because they also do a red wine and sure. then uh, after the vintage 2017 I went back for the blending session in November for the uh, sparkling production and um, yeah. so the the red wine blending to me it was pure science not obviously not pure science but the, the part of the experience that I got involved was mm. pure science because I was supposed to make a blend for, for a 75 uh, cl bottle blend from I don't remember how many different oak barrels. So I had like the head wine maker gave me a list. He said, okay, take like 30 CL from, uh, no, 3 CL from this, 5 CL from this, 2 CL from this, like kind of uh, with the no numbers of each barracks. And yeah. I was with like, a, with a, uh, how do you call this? Um, the pipette. Yes. Pipette, yeah, the pipette. Yeah. With, with that pipette, I was going from each barrel and the barrel, and I had, I had to climb, you know, the barrels sure. were, were on top of the others. Sure. Very dark room with my light here. It took me to do one, a blend of one bottle, 75 CL, I think three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I said, okay, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was it was a great experience. But it was totally, and then obviously we tasted it, and then we saw like what can we improve. But obviously, I mean, I I was just following the instructions. There, I only got involved in the science part. But then when we did the the blending session of the the harvest in November after the uh, first fermentations were done, mm -hmm. uh, before the second fermentation to see the blend of the sparkling. Mm -hmm. It was a total different experience. That it was like tasting, 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 and then, and it was a collective work, not only one seller master, but no, a no, team sure. work. Yeah. 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 And then there, I think it was more to thinking about the future. Yes, the blend is good now, but this wine, this blend will go on the second fermentation. It will stay there uh, for a quite a lot of time and then it will stay in the cellar and then we will release this one let's say in three years five years and then yeah. then it was thinking for the time that it reaches the end consumer sure. so there it's an important vision included yeah, in that yeah, as well and that's not easy i think that's not easy and i i i'm sure that uh, the person who's doing that in toreo uh, or the team that they're very experienced in it. It's not something you can let a, a young novice winemaker do alone. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. you really you need to know what you're doing. You need to have experience from the past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, by the way, think that um, uh, hundred percent Charello will always give the best possible sparkling wine in the region, or would a blend with other varieties uh, possibly give a, a similar or better quality? 100% Cerello. 100% Cerello, I think Alberti Noia does 100% Cerello. Oh, right? there are plenty. Gramona yeah. has some wines and Ricaredo. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think there's not enough experience for that to see how the long run will go with 100%. I mm -hmm. think the Cerello itself, uh, it has an amazing acidity structure backbone to give a, a, pro, a product itself 100% but still mm -hmm. I would go for a little bit I think it will lack some weight no uh, Cerello I, I would know. go I for blending it, it, I was just thinking about it because everybody agrees and I agree too that Cerello is the, the, the best variety available but um, you could also say that for Bordeaux Cabernet Sauvignon is the best variety they've got nevertheless mm -hmm. nevertheless they is blending so um, even if Charello is the very best grape they've got, the question is, does it also produce as a single varietal wine the very best possible wine? Maybe, I, I don't have the answer, but I wouldn't take it for granted because, uh, mm -hmm. and actually that's another interesting experience I had in the, in the Benedes during a, uh, a tour of uh, Cava wineries uh, when, when Corpina didn't exist yet, uh, three years mm -hmm. ago. 
and um, we, we went to, to it was three days and three four visits per day and um, and everybody's of course talking about Charello and stuff uh, mm-hmm. but then um, um, somewhere I'm not sure I don't remember maybe Jube comes but I don't know somewhere we got a, um, a Chardonnay based wine or a blend with Chardonnay and and it was damn good. And of course it was because Chardonnay is actually a great variety for sparkling wine. There is no discussion about that. And I was, I, I was thinking by myself, damn, um, I, wish I, I, I wish it wasn't that good. Because in a way, you know, as we are all victims of, uh, of, our, of, our, of obsession with authenticity, I noticed that actually I was... I, I wanted Charello to be the, the only really star of, of, of the area, but I noticed mm-hmm. that Chardonnay can reach exactly the same quality without any mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. It's just a bit less authentic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing is, like Char- Charello, in this example, Charello can be the best variety, but it's, it doesn't mean that it necessarily will be the best on its own. It can always mm, exactly. take advantage from a compliment. Exactly, and that's my point, yeah. actually. And, yeah. and, and, I mean, and Maccabeo, for example, is also a lovely grape variety. So yes, certainly. So so maybe indeed by 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 blending, you will be able to get uh, at the end of the day a wine that is slightly better than just being varietal uh, Charello. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah. But uh, it's also good to have the varietal Charellos as an experiment to have a, like a, a different options to explore something fresh blood. Sure. See. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. There was yeah. a, there was a comment actually yes when we talked about blending uh, Carlos uh, said Jerez is a very authentic example of blending he said yes Jerez is a quite good example of blending True. but it is a uh, d- totally different type of blending solar yeah. system yeah uh, but yeah. No, no, definitely, definitely. And uh, although, although in a way, the blending there again has a, a slightly different um, functionality. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's not forget, um, um, there are now from, I think it's from Carajuelas, there are single vineyard, single vintage Matanias, single vineyard, single vintage Matanias, which are mm-hmm. lovely, which are beautiful Matanias. Mm-hmm. So apparently, you can also achieve. Uh, beautiful Jerez, well, at least probably not as an old one, but as a younger wine uh, by uh, by not blending. Yeah, it's also yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's so many possibilities. I remember when I was working in a hospitality in New York, one day a, a customer came and then she was asking a wine recommendation, and I ex- a, I recommended a blend, a Bordeaux blend from Turkey to that customer, and then the customer said to me, No, I don't like blends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And that's crazy. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's crazy. That is that is something like saying I don't like Chardonnay. The, like sh- there's so many different expressions of Chardonnay, you know. So yeah, what exactly yeah. you don't like or what exactly you don't like with blending. No, so we should be we should be open to the different uh, options, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me think of the 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 Brunello scandal more than 10 years ago. And the scandal was that actually they found out that numerous Brunello de Montalcino wineries were illegally blending in French grape varieties in Brunello, which is not allowed. Brunello has to be 100% Sangiovese. But they mm-hmm. did that. Everybody knew they did. And actually, if you visited the vineyards, you could see that there was, there was not just Sangiovese in the vineyards. Everybody knew it. But all of a sudden, it became a major issue and there were police raids and whatever. And then the whole story faded away, and um, um, I, I, I don't know. At it, it, first, it looked like many wineries were in big trouble, but but then the whole thing, in typical Southern European way, just faded away, and I think mm-hmm. they all got away with it. And I'm I'm not sure that they stopped doing it. But the question is, of course, why did they do that? Because apparently, by adding a percentage, I don't know, ten percent or whatever, of Cabernet or Merlot. Brunello de Montalcino became a better wine. It's against mm-hmm. our feeling that wine should be authentic and whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating that actually, yeah, but, but, but apparently they felt that it made a better wine. It gave them better mm-hmm. ratings actually. Actually, yeah. when you say this, 
if the, so with everything changing climate changing so on maybe it's the the appellations they need to also flex be a little bit more flexible nowadays but because maybe now some additions in the laws or the legislations of the appellations maybe can give better results could be could be we'll see we'll see where it all goes mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to predict but um well you know that in in bordeaux they are experimenting with uh, Turiga Nacional. I mean, not not like it's officially allowed to use yet, but they're thinking mm -hmm. about it and they're planting something. There are some 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 well, some research being done, you know. So who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Because of climate change, that in the future, Turiga Nacional becomes part of a Bordeaux blend. Who knows? Mm -hmm. huh? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So then, but maybe I mean, if it is not if it is not going to happen, then they need to leave the appellation just to to be able to use it. No. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think I'm out, outside experimentation is not even allowed at all. Not even for mm -hmm. GP or whatever. No, it's pure experimentation. But the, but the, the whole world, I think, is experimenting because uh, because you have to. So yes, it's true. Blends may change over time, and actually, bl blends have changed over time. Yeah, mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. If sticking to Bordeaux, the percentage of Merlot and Bordeaux also in, in the Hot Medoc has been growing in the last 30 years uh, mm -hmm. considerably, actually, for the simple reason that by blending in more Merlot, the wine is easier approachable when it's younger, mm -hmm. which is nowadays um, quite necessary. You know, no, nobody in the world nowadays wants to buy wines that you cannot drink for the first 25 years. Uh, there is no market for this anymore. And Mallow helps you um, to solve Make it more the, accessible. To solve that problem, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now with the upcoming crisis after COVID-19, maybe they will increase the percentage of Mallow more to make it more accessible for the cash flow. <laughs> I think what they should do, uh, I think they should not increase Mallow, they should decrease prices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's one question. Uh, let's before uh, um, finish the session. Let's answer this question. Uh, do you have an extraordinary blending experience with an unusual grape varieties? Asking Gonja. Hmm. 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 Nothing comes to mind, to be honest. Personally, mm. no. But but there are, what I find well, it's, it's it's not answering the question. But if I'm thinking of a, a rather unusual successful blend, I'm thinking of Mana, a wine made uh, by Franz Haas. It's actually one of my favorite wines from Südtirol. It's um, mm. it, it's a blend he makes from from quite aromatic grapes, and Riesling is the most important uh, element in that blend, and that's quite unusual in Südtirol, and it's a lovely wine. So Südtirol is is basically in white wine, it's it's, it's almost always single varietal wines, of course, mm -hmm. uh, um, but his uh, most expensive, most successful, best known wine is Mana, which is a blend, and it's an unusual blend. Yeah. What is the name again? Mana. 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 Okay, after the session, I will post it in the story so that uh, oh, people can see. It. I, yeah. I always order it if I can get it. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Um, should we answer one more question? Sure. Or no, actually, there's one, one comment from Anna. Anna says, when I blend, always I taste the same wine from few previous vintages to compare. Um, actually, that's a good point as well. Uh, one, one wine... Uh, let's say 50% Cabernet, 40% Merlot, and 10% Petit Verdot. But mm -hmm. depending on the year, this this percentages can change. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. They should. They should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they should. But then uh, they, uh, here again, the art changing the calculations, the math, mm -hmm. uh, achieving the same style year after year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 But you know, you ne you never have exactly the same quantities. Well, if you're working with your own vineyard, you never have exactly the same quantity of wine available every year uh, um, from the different grape varieties, and and in Bordeaux too. You know, I mean, in the 
I remember nowadays, if you look at the website of the Bordeaux Chateaus, they will tell you for every vintage exactly uh, the percentage of the blend. But 30 mm -hmm. years ago, you got, a, a, you got like the percentage of the vineyards. And of course, that, that's, that is rubbish because uh, the percentage of the vineyard um, in, of a Bordeaux Chateau does not represent the percentages in the blend. Not at all. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So don't believe on everything you read. <laughs> No, for sure, no, for sure. take a lesson. No. Great, thank you so much, Frank. Uh, Times and Wine says perhaps you can discuss new trends and varieties that appear in the classic wine regions and appellations in your future sessions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. We can do that, and we can think about it, and we can do one session for authenticity in wine. <laughs> Yes, uh, that will be. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, depending on how long the confinement will last, we can be more creative. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the next four weeks. I can tell you so, uh, and for guaranteed. So let's see. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. so we'll see you more then. Thank okay. you so much. I'll see you on Friday. Great bubbles again on Friday. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Bye, okay. Frank. See you all. See you all. See bye -bye. everyone. Nice see you on Friday. Bye. Bye.